Hi, everybody. We're here all week, so don't forget to tip your waiter. Um, this is unlike any period in the time of aging services, and I've been involved for almost 30 years. We've got four forces that are at play that are significant. Government debt, sequester, fiscal cliff, um, the health care reform, and changing demographics and consumer preferences. In the 70s, 3,500 homes like this closed. And that was at a time when money was rushing into the system, and now we've got money rushing out of the system. So we need to make significant change and fast. If all we do is wring our hands, then we're missing the opportunity. And so, as Einstein would say, rather than doing this, we should be doing this. We should be looking at this and saying, wait a minute, this is a terrific time of opportunity. We've all heard about the silver tsunami, the number of elderly, that's our work, that's our mission. If we think of this as opportunity, um, if we start to think perhaps as entrepreneurs would, um, we have an abundant field in front of us. But time is running short. And I've seen this more in the last two years than I've ever seen it in the last 10. That the opportunities that we've seen in at-home services, in developing new products, are slipping by us. You only have to go back to assisted living in the 1990s to understand what I'm talking about. Look at this chart. This, looks, this is the percentage of for-profit assisted living across the United States. And it doesn't look like a very big deal, right? 73% in 1985 to 85% in 2005. If you look at it as a nonprofit market share, we lost 30% of the market share of assisted living in 10 years. And we lost almost 50% in 20 years. We can't allow that to happen again. So we've got a decision to make. We're at a crossroads. We can strike out, think differently, or we can become irrelevant. One of the things that's clear to me is that senior living organizations don't die quickly, they die over time. But let's go back and talk about life. Let's talk about our founders. When they started our organizations, whether it's 20 or 100 years ago, they dreamt big and they acted with passion. And frequently they didn't have much in the way of resources, but they had a dream and a, and a commitment to make it happen. We often don't think about entrepreneurship and nonprofit 501c3 organizations, but we have to think this way. Because if we look at the middle, innovative, flexible, dynamic, creative, growth-oriented, that's us. And we're not risk-taking, we're risk-managing. Here's the biggest risk. The biggest risk is doing nothing. And it's the one that feels most comfortable to us because we rarely stop and ask the question, what happens if I don't make change? There's an equation that leads to success, and it begins with the board. Take the innovation and passion that we're capable of above, moderate the risk, add leadership, and that's what I'm going to talk about in the closing moments, and that will equal our success. We start at a very poor point. 17% of executives said their board was effective as possible. These words that are here, they've been said by members of leading age. The last one is what we should all be saying. Our board is my secret weapon, but we don't. All right, so how do we do this? Well, first of all, we need a, we need a strategic board, and we get that by changing process. Elevate monitoring and not abdicate. Become more effective at monitoring what's important, but take less time. We need to clear the deck of unimportant issues during board meetings. It's a simple process change. Let's take the mundane stuff and move it off the agenda. And now let's focus on what the big issues are. And let's encourage conflict at times. Let's take the guy who's always the naysayer and elevate him to a position of importance. How do we create the entrepreneurial board? Well, first we have strategic. That's a change of process. Entrepreneurial board is a change of thinking. So one's process and one's thought. And let me give you a couple of examples and, and they'll go quickly. Mission. Historically and today, we typically look at mission as a limiter. Oh, I can't do that because it's outside of the mission. We should be saying, that's a great opportunity. How else might I serve? Stewardship's been defined as what do we have and how do we protect it, rather than what do we have and how can I invest it? The question is resources. If we think about um, all I've got is this, that means I can only do this piece. Rather than saying, we've got this tremendous opportunity, now what I've got to figure out is how do I bring the resources to bear? So whether they're an investor, whether there's a REIT, um, or some other approach is the way an entrepreneur would think. And so the question isn't what's our borrowing capacity, the question is what's our partnering capacity? Um, and we don't think in terms of, well, that's a $5 million project. We think of it as a $50,000 project that as we go along, we'll find out whether it works or whether it won't. Too often we judge our success by did we meet budget or did we vary from something. We should be judging our success by the lives that we've touched.
Thank you. As I said, we'll be here all week. Tip the waiter.